Well, it is now official. Our VAERS zip file size, for those not familiar, our Vaccine Averse Event Reporting System zip file, which, for example, if you look at our Vaccine Events, events Adverse Event Reporting System, which basically accumulates all the vaccine adverse event reports, for example, for 2021 is now 125.92 megabytes. See your size right there? Now, the interesting part about this file size and the Rubicon that has been crossed is as follows. Our reports on vaccine adverse events just from the January 2021 to today, about September 18th, September 19th, is now 125.92 megabytes. The reason that is of significance is because if you take this data from here, 1990, all the way up to 2020, that obviously is 30 years, you combine all the adverse event reports from 1990 to 2020, vaccine adverse event reports, I should say, and you compare all those files combined for 30 years to just this partial year from January to September, you'll notice that basically the information accumulated from January to today, 2021, is larger than all 30 years of vaccine adverse event reports combined. That is the Rubicon that has been crossed. And with that in mind, good morning, I should say, to our data scientists, uh, data analysts, bioinformatics, epidemiologist, biostatisticians, and all of our data like minded audience, just the same, and policymakers as well. Good morning. And let's get right into the data we'll be covering right off the bat. So we'll go back to the data analysis towards the end. But the stories we'll be covering are as follows. Now, but before I begin as well, uh, basically for the fact checkers out there, blah, 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 or the truth police, uh, the disclaimer is as follows. Basically, this the reports submitted to the VAERS reporting system cannot be used to determine if a vaccine caused or contributed to an adverse event or illness. These reports contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable, unverifi meaning they're just reports being submitted to VAERS which yield what's called safety signals. There it goes. And so it all has to be validated. So just take everything with a grain of salt that's reported to these vaccine adverse event reporting systems. But now, we want to take a little bit of a tangent to reference to the COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 aspects because there's a wonderfully brilliant article in reference to basically what may be driving the spread of this particular uh, COVID-19. And it revolves around, one is environmental aspects in reference to the environmental microbiome, but also to, if you read here, nitrous oxide. Keep that in mind, N2O. And why this is important, what this leads to a basically inevitable outcome is as follows. Now, the inevitable outcome is potentially mitigation factors reduce negative outcomes in reference to if an individual contract, contracted, uh, contracted, yeah, contracted, uh, basically COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. And you'll see, for example, they'll maybe make a recommendation of arginine or citrulline. Why? because they're trying to get NO basically up to par. Now, NO, let's get right into what that is, for those not familiar, uh, is as follows. Now, keep in mind, think of it this way. If there's your nitric oxide right there, if, let's say, from a purely, uh, how would describe it, sublime aspect, uh, let's say the planet goes through its own natural cycle of correction. And I am going to imply, for example, nitric oxide, nitrous oxide, I should say, is a very, very potent uh, climate catalyst, which basically can 
potentially contribute to climate warning, warning, climate warming, which ironically is also one of the primary components uh, produ or uh, chemicals produced through catalytic converters. Even though they made improvements, that's a, that's a true irony because, you know, catalytic converters were reduced in CO2 emissions and what do catalytic converters produce? Nitrous oxide is a byproduct. But let's not go off on a tangent. But it may be important. And here we go. Nonetheless, in areas where a novel coronavirus disease, COVID-19, was at its worst, for example, Wuhan, China, Mumbai, India, Milan, Italy, Washington, USA, etc., the reduction of N2O, nitrous oxide, emissions was well noticed. Nonetheless, viruses exhibited greater mobility than humans and hijacked nutrients, including nitrogen, to complete their epidemiological cycle, all due to limited sequence space of viral genomes, the high probability of genetic drift, extremely large population sizes, the high mutation and recombination rates in consequence of a drastic fall of nitrous oxide. Emissions, lower human transport cannot be all alone contributor but contrarily, it may also be associated with coronavirus intrinsic factors. So now let's get back to that sci-fi aspect. Let's say, for example, a virus comes into being and this nitrous oxide is a great threat to uh, life on the planet. And or let's say, for example, even a geoterrorist or a crazy geoengineer, however you want to do it, and they want to release something into the, or basically someone's experimenting with uh, uh, something that can help uh, mitigate uh, some of these uh, climate catalysts that may contribute to a climate change or global warming and something escapes from a lab, not because they're trying to uh, create safer you know, medicines for humans, but because they're trying to basically a geoengineer through either like an algae substance, bacteria, so on and so forth. You get the idea where you can get that, that sci-fi type feel to it. But however, though, as sublime as it may seem, or not as connected uh, as it may appear, as we think of medicine, uh, we think of disease. We don't think of the environmental microbiome. Uh, we don't think of what feeds these certain elements in the environment because we're very, very uh, often our focus is very myopic upon ourselves and not our place inside this ecosphere. But let us proceed with this article. Well, let, let me get the art, other articles we're going to cover in a bit. We're going to come back to this, all right? So well, this will be the first one we come back to. We're also going to cover as follows a wonderful article on part two. The pesticide used destroying the microbiome that's usually, usually used to help protect us, unknowingly for many of us, of other nasty things in the environment. It all plays together. Then we're going to be looking at, for example, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. I'm just going to cover this one real fast anyways. Uh, I'll have the links, of course. The reduced magnitude and durability of immune, uh, immune response by COVID-19 mRNA vaccines in older adults. Uh, just basically the, the synopsis for people that don't know. So people are not at each other's throats saying, well, it's, you know, it's a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Wow, that's so, so not bright. Because our observation that 35% of older adults failed to neutralize SARS-CoV-2, you know, even at, this is the original strain it's made for too, even after two vaccine doses also emphasize the ongoing infection risk in this population. So 35% of older adults received two shots and they failed to neutralize SARS-CoV-2. All right, so you, you see where... It's very, very simplistic to just point at one group per se. There's so many dynamics involved uh, that most people are unaware of, but to proceed forward. Then we'll also cover this. Second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic in Delhi and India, a high seroprevalence, not a deterrent. Then we're gonna cover, I wanna jump into it real fast, but I, I, the timing is difficult. Uh, MNRA covered 19 vaccination development to see confirmed myocarditis where they're saying that the case of myocarditis really, really, really by a factor of 10 underestimated according to new 
relevant data. Then, as well, evidence that vitamin D might protect against severe COVID-19 disease and death. It brings some highlights in reference to some of the, the uh, pitfalls and the confounding of uh, some of the articles that tried to discount vitamin D in reference to COVID-19. It said those studies were not done appropriately and they came to a different conclusion. Then as follows, what pushed Israel out of herd immunity? Uh, let's cover this one real fast uh, because it reiterates, we're getting a lot of mixed articles in the news of uh, these best case scenarios reference to vaccine effectiveness. And I'm not trying to discount them by looking for confirmation bias or selection bias, but people need to know that there is a wide range of opinions in the scientific community as well as research, for example, as follows. Later, the waning of the immunity was confirmed in multiple studies worldwide showing that the above vaccine effectiveness, VE, is reduced to below 50% after five months of the second dose. To reiterate, vaccine effectiveness is reduced to below 50% after five months of the second dose. Looking at domination and Delta variant here, to the breakthrough infection, so on and so forth. Finally, the Israeli government reinstated some of the MPIs, non-pharmaceutical inventions of late June, including indoor masking, green passports, and mandatory isolations. Uh-huh. All right. That will, so we covered this. I'll have the link for you again, just so you can reiterate and have information available at hand. All right. Proceed as follows. We'll be going to verse reactions to the vaccine. This is amazing. Go uh, check it out because... Again, often people feel isolated and they feel embarrassed. If they have a reaction to a vaccine, for example, and they're very, very, let's say, pro-inoculation, there's nothing wrong with that. But however, often people will be embarrassed to state how they feel in reference to um, inoculation gone awry. All right, then we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, food products that reduce COVID transmission. This is like amazing. We'll save that for later. And then our various database, what happened here? Oh, I must have skipped ahead to uh, the evolution of the virus is, for example, has become I'm like, whoa. So a lot of the mitigation factors that worked with original uh, variants uh, didn't, even, didn't even take into account the alpha variant. The alpha variant was 40, you know, 43 to 100 times more virus in the air, for example, than the original Wuhan variant. And... But most of the data is being done on the original variant, where the new variant is like newer variants, I should say, is like, is like, yeah, wrap your head in the round of the towel seven or eight times different times. It's like this stuff is just incredibly, incredibly um, uh, prolific, prolif prolific. All right, then we prefer it follows that that done with those databases and the resources, and so we'll just come back to later on. Let's get right into the, uh, the interesting ones again. This can lead to other treatments as well as other mitigation factors in place. So even though it may sound science fiction wise, uh, you have to really look at it from an aspect of thinking outside the box in reference to potentially preventing other pathogens in the future. So this is a great test run per se. Let's proceed follows. I right, read this part. This prompted us Quoting, of course, to analyze freely accessible and large global data from two authenticated sources, the World Health Organization and the World Bank. We hereby argue that the intrinsic factor of N2O, which is nitrous oxide right there, and NO, keep in mind nitric oxide, intrinsic factor nitrous oxide emissions fueling the COVID-19 progression significantly. Entire predictions were found consistent with the recently observed, observed shreds of evidence. These insights enhance scientific ability to interrogate viral epidemiology and recommend a seven-point framework covering all natural lifestyle and dietary supplements for COVID-19 prevention before the arrival of a frontline therapeutics or preventable vaccine. All right, when's the date on this one? That was September 14, 2020, so there must have been a little bit of preprint ahead of time. To proceed, nitrous oxide, popularly known as laughing gas, Nitrogen dioxide, NO2, and free radical molecule nitric oxide are the most abundant in the air. Nitrous, oxida nitrous oxide oxidation by ozone can occur at any temperature 
and is considered as an ozone depleting substance with a long half-life of 100 to 150 years. I'm going to read kind of fast here, but you'll get the point. And then, of course, the article is going to be linked as well. D and O nitric oxide is produced in many tissues from arginine. That's important right there. Remember that word, that amino acid. And molecular oxygen by four distinct isoforms of nitric oxide synthase. Da 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 da. Right, I'm going to read through nitric oxide reductase. And please forgive me if I move forward. Uh, and it goes, turns out that nitric oxide is an ideal messenger in the human with a very short half life of 2 to 30 seconds. These characteristics of nitric oxide allow, also allow its free diffusion across bio biomembranes and spontaneous signal transmissions to perform a wide variety of physiological functions, including olfactory signal procession, sense of smell, platelet clotting, smooth muscle, muscle, muscle relaxation, and vasodilation. Blood flow regulation in the brain, heart, lung, gastrointestinal tract. Remember in the beginning, too, a lot of people had issues with digestion, which we probably could associate the microbiome as well, but you can you can draw the correlation. Kidney, blood pressure regulation, cardiac contractility, and killing, killing or inhibition of pathogens. Despite having a large physio, despite having large physiological functions, the global warming potential of one gram. One gram of N2O is 265 to 298 times of the same carbon dioxide for a 100-year time scale. Go back and make sure rethink those catalytic converters to some extent, doesn't it? All right, let's proceed forward. There's so much you want to cover. That's why I want to have the link so you can read through it on your own. But still, just to grab the highlights. The COVID-19 patients have mild to severe symptoms. Most are seeing seeming closely linked with the physiological functions of NO, such as loss of olfactory sensation, platelet clotting, difficulty in breathing, multi-organ, brain, heart, lung, gastrointestinal tract, and kidney failure, etc. In fact, recently the FDA approved inhaled nitric oxide for COVID-19 emergency used to biotherapeutics company uh, Belarophon Therapeutics. In addition, a fall in nitrous oxide and 2 gas emissions was noticed in local areas affected like local affected areas after the surge of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Consequently, these real evidences convince us that the physiological role of substrate of NO in COVID-19 management and huge spread of SARS-CoV-2 virus may be due to the atmospheric imbalance of N2O. Furthermore, there's considerable evidence that intrinsic, intrinsic, extrinsic, or environment implicit in host factors are key regulators of any pathogen transmission. An intrinsic factor both operationally and conceptually have yet to be reached for full annihilation of COVID-19. Suppressing N2O emissions seems to be the most viable pathway for attaining the great health challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. So, that's where it comes down to. So it's kind of weird because you're not looking at the microcosm of an individual. I mean, obviously, we're doing this to protect the individual. But however, though, on an environmental scale, to shut down elements that may be responsible for N2O production, could it possibly lead to basically pandemic mitigation factors as far as thinking outside the box? And of course, these individuals, I'll give an example, uh, did quite a bit of research uh, in reference to it. So you'll, if you go to the uh, the charts, for example, you could see where they draw the correlations of higher. Is look at the uh, the carbon dioxide emission from China and like Brazil, and you could see, for example, uh, all of there's India areas where, for example, is certain areas where there's virtually no uh, COVID-19, but at the same time too. There's also virtually no uh, CO2 or, nit or N2O production. And that's where it really came down to even on the abstract. And then here is, of course, Russian Federation, United States, and that's our CO2 production and our nitric nit N2O production. And if you want to compare that with China again, uh, where, you know, you can draw your own conclusions. If you if this should render to 4K. But however, though, there we have it. And for example, we go down here 
we go results and discussion. Here at the large variation, we observed a good consistent correlation between N2 omission and cumulative COVID-19 cases from the last year. Moreover, the Z test with the probability P values falls below the level of significance of 0.05. All right, blah, 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 blah. All right. Reveal there is a significant relationship between N2 omissions and cumulative COVID-19 cases. Remember, correlation is not causation, but still just the same is just enthralling. The result of analysis shows the calculated values of the Z-test that are the Z-critical two-tail, 1.96, revealing there is a positive significant relationship between N2O emissions and cumulative COVID-19 cases. Overall, these findings are further supported by real global evidence and suggest that N2O gas emissions significantly increase SARS-CoV-2 virus transmission. According to the Oxford University report, agriculture consists of the largest source of N2O gas emissions. 100 folds in comparison to transport vehicles. So 100 more full more times. So and both synthetic fertilizers, pesticides usually increase the negative environmental footprint of agriculture by contributing to greenhouse N2O emissions. Surprisingly, fall of N2O gas emissions was noticed in infected areas after the surge. That's so, I mean, you could say, well, there's lockdowns and things like that, less, uh, less movement, less production. That's not necessarily the case. All because people were, were inside the home didn't mean that, that would cause the fall of N2O. Is it possible when you think about it that the pathogen could result in consumption of the N2O in order to complete its epidemiological life cycle? See, that's just so, I mean, fantastical uh, when you think about it. But it's But they have the data there. And they show potentially strong correlation. And it's supported by natural virus evolutions that utilizes major N2O emissions. Hence, the sporadic COVID-19 instances are in full agreement with intrinsic N2O emissions and suggest that these emissions is emerging as SARS-CoV-2 virus feed supplements. To proceed, the COVID-19 attributing factors with recently observed evidence, for instance, a fall in the N2O gas emissions after the surge so what happens is, is the high N2O levels, then the virus comes in, and then the N2 levels drop. Uh, N2O itself is a biochemical precursor of NO. High blood sugar, a reduced ability to produce an NO, nitric oxide. High blood pressure, NO inactivation. Obesity, inhibit NO. Smoking, inhibit uh, bio, uh, biomolecular signaling molecular NO via nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Concurrent drug use and high salt intake attenuates NO production. It has been corroborated that its SARS-CoV-2 virus is surviving, it's been corroborated that SARS-CoV-2 virus is surviving using the N2O energy source in atmosphere and in human population. Once again, COVID-19 pathophysiology, physiology, and common symptoms, fever, apnea, cough, tiredness, and highly vulnerable groups, and highly vulnerable groups, such as hypertensive diabetics, Smoker and obese individuals all observed reduced bioactive NO after COVID-19 viral entry. To proceed, as a result of NO inhibition, common symptoms, fever, cough, and tiredness, and difficulty in breathing were appearing after COVID-19 infection. Remember, this is strong correlation. And again, keep an open mind in reference to this because thinking outside the box can yield some pretty uh, miraculous outcomes as far as new discoveries and mitigation factors. The NO inducible agents, for example, hydroxychloroquine is being clinically relevant in COVID-19 treatment. A review of nitric oxide enhancement strategies emphasizes main dietary strategies for more safe and effective NO based solutions than NO donating therapeutics. All right, here comes the recommendations from the researchers here in reference to uh, mitigating depletion of NO. Uh, so here we go. The NO inactivation concept has evolved from the current approach and endorsed novel SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus is greatly dependent upon local places with high N2O emissions. To reiterate, so the current approach and endorsed novel SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus is greatly dependent upon local places with high N2O emissions in past and current N2O is turning low. It's surprising been it is, it's surprising, but most infected places, Wuhan, New York, Mumbai, Milan, are perfect falling in this line, are perfect falling in this line, intrinsic factors. In response, 
This study also proposed a framework of all natural supplements for COVID-19 reduction, not prevention, reduction, by means of lifestyle and dietary supplements as follows. And spoke our potential diabetics, IBS individuals, or highly vulnerable groups require counseling and strict attention, as reported above. Indoor fitness exercise includes uh, meditation, yoga, one of the frontline COVID-19 reduction markers, which increase NO production. People, I'm going to make this a little bigger because the uh, the wording is really small. Let's see if we can make it there. All right. People are, are advised to consume a very minimum amount of sugar and salt. Both sugar and salt decreases NO production. Interesting. Patients with polypharmacy of concurrent drugs, for example, statins, fibrates, Da da da, da da, metamorphic vitamins, aspirin, da da, polycytophenol, and plant flavonoids should remain attentive. Polypharmacy attenuates NO production. Consumption of natural L arginine rich sources, for example, dairy products, soybeans, peanuts, spirulina, lentils, eggs, etc. L arginine is a precursor of NO production, and citrulline supplementation using natural sources, for example, watermelon, pumpkins, cucumbers, etc. Citrulline stimulates de novo arginine production. Moderate consumption of nit nitrate-rich foods, natural sources such as beetroot, spinach, lettuce, chervil, chervil, please forgive me, I do not know how to pronounce that, chervil, radish, celery, pomegranate, etc. Nitrate, nitrite, NO is a second metabolic pathway. In line with modern science, multifactorial uh, multi approach, this study is endorsing nature's role in pathogen evasion to limit the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 pathogen. The similar approach helped researchers think undoubtedly about the causation of COVID-19 disease. We hope these insights presents, uh, presented above, along with disease reduction framework, will be a game changer in fighting against the COVID-19 pandemic before the launch of frontline therapeutics or preventable vaccines. So this must be written a little bit ahead of time. But you get an idea. That is an amazing article. And it was just published September 14th. Now we're going to go to part two of this one particular article. Now, we're going to move kind of fast because obviously we spent about 27 minutes preluding it. Implicit, we want to get to the, the point of this article. Uh, basically, what they're claiming is this. Let's just get right to the abstract. How did Bhutan, as a Bhutan, a nation sharing a boundary with China, manage nearly 0.34% infections and three deaths from COVID-19? Why the United States, India, and Brazil are the first three most affected nations, and how did? We just covered. The nonspecific pesticides. Now, this correlation we also found uh, in other studies as well. So this is kind of like a, um, you know, post ex facto. We kind of knew this. This is just going to be a little bit redundant, but still let's go into their hypothesis to proceed forward. Nonspecific pesticides killed both pests as well as protected microbiota resulting in a loss in rich biodiversity and allow easy pathogen entry to humans. Entire predictions are found consistent with recently observed evidences. These insights enhance scientific ability to interrogate viral epidemiology and recommend to limit pesticide use for future pandemic prevention. Now, I know how it sounds. Here you have N2O, uh, a climate changing catalyst potentially. Just Move that. Just say, hey, don't don't focus on basically the political biases that can basically integrate into it. Think of purely pandemic mitigation strategy. Now, if something is damaging the environmental microbiome, and by damaging the micro environmental microbiome is allowing some nasty things to rise which normally would not rise, let's take this into consideration. To proceed. Airborne prokaryotes, I used to not pronounce that, prokaryotes, also represent a large fraction of 5 to the 10 to the 19 CFU. The average microbe, I can't pronounce anything, the average microbial density on Earth is approximately 10 to the 8 microbes a milliliter, which show inseparable interactions between humans and microbes everywhere on the planet. Particularly, the human itself contains trillions of microbiome in a surprising ratio of 10 to 1 with human cells. A huge number of a total of 10 to the 30 prokaryotes, oh gosh, I can't pronounce it tonight, please forgive me, prokaryotes, prokaryotes exist on Earth. Out of about 1,400 uh, microbial species that recognize human pathogens, I would go on and on in this, in reference to the biomass, 
distribution. Hang on one second, but uh, let's uh, come right back. Hang on. Prokaryotes. Oh, sorry. I had to pause it for a second because I didn't mean not pronouncing it correctly. It was just driving me up the wall. Prokaryotes. Prokaryotes. Got it. All right. They exist on Earth. Proceed forward. All right. Let's go through the research. A report by the Food and, uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations suggests that China is the world's largest consumer of agricultural chemicals in the country, which, are, which alone uses more than 30% of the global fertilizers, pesticides, and 9% of the global cropland to fulfill the high food demands. Second, pesticides, con second pesticide consumers in the United States, third, Brazil. All right, you see the pattern there? Uh, are we the first three largest COVID-19 affected areas, blah, blah, blah. A further, the fourth pesticide consuming country, Argentina, and go on and on and on. on. Uh, Canada, Ukraine, France, so on and so forth. On the, on the other hand, Holy Organic Bhutan reports just 2,258 COVID-19 infected individuals, and most of them are imported cases only. In India, the largest pesticide consumer state, um, yeah, as of July 11, 2021, Please forgive me. I'm not skipping it out of disrespect. I just Maharashtra is with a hot. Again, feel free to correct me. I have no ego in reference to that. I'd much rather get it right than go on internally pronouncing it wrong. With the highest out of 117,270 total COVID-19 cases, whereas the wholly organic Indian state Sikkim is with a low number of 2,244. Countries with high population dead in city, including Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, etc., are not that much affected. As leading pesticide consumers provide further evidence to redefine multifactor approach in COVID-19, a handful of healthy soil comprising millions of ecological communities of microbes, microbiota, also regarded as a protective shield against pathogen invasion. And of course, you know, there's a picture. I had to proceed. All right. With increased urbanization awareness of home pest control methods all, all over, for, that, for instance, New York, U.S., Bergamo, Italy, Community of Madrid, Spain, New Delhi, India, Sao Paulo, Brazil have become favorable for insecticide consumption. These places also become the epicenter of COVID-19 outbreaks. The SARS-CoV-2 virus continued mutating natural evolution led to increased transmissibility, vir virulence, and resistance to antibody neutralization, posed as recently as 14 June 2021. We have all the variants. SARS-CoV-2 virus contains the genetic element. Now, this is interesting. You ready? Let's let, here we go. SARS-CoV-2 SARS virus contains the genetic element S2M. And as reported by the Tangs and co-workers, recently a xenolog of S2M was found in a large number of insect species. Again, we're just going for total information awareness. If you, if you remember the old DARPA logo. Uh, that's interesting. The virus contains genetic element S2M as reported by the Tengs and co-workers recently the xenolog of S2M was found in a large number of insect species. As a result, the early record of total pesticides recently shifted to insecticides used in this report. Undoubtedly, microbiota represents the first line of defense and protection against pathogens. For instance, presence of commensal microbiome in the human skin offers temperature regulation, ultraviolet radiation protection, vitamin D production, and most importantly, keeping pathogenic microbes outside the body. The pesticides are non-specific and it is indiscriminate use leads to the degradation of use of microbiota, which may likely to increase the harmful pathogen entry into, hum into humans. Recent findings with high correlation values are in agreement that local insecticide consumer sites may likely increase the high transmissibility of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So it's interesting. You destroy the microbiome of the, of the terrain, the geology, the geography, and you open a door the virus is just as this. So if you look at the correlation between the two aspects, between nitric oxide and pesticide use, you create the perfect storm. You see where they're, you see where they're coming from? You, you're altering the environment. By altering the environment, the environment itself is there for a reason, obviously, not just to breathe and walk in. The environment or the microbiome in the environment may be there because it is the environment which mitigated or oppressed nasty biological elements that may have been not advantageous towards life evolving even. In fact, there was even a hypothesis in reference to the extinction of the dinosaurs that it wasn't necessarily an asteroid or an asteroid may have played a role. 
but the inevitable outcome was an alteration of the environmental microbiome. So you get that sci-fi feeling if you had someone which was geo-terrorist or geo-engineer. Now they know they can create a virus and it can mitigate other chemical catalysts. Let's just say they're just like, you know, don't, they don't care about people. You can see exactly how they can attempt to geoengineer the planet in such a way to keep the climate to where they want to keep it and take away any other mitigating factors that can basically not be conducive to that outcome, if you know what I mean. To proceed as follows, next article. All right, we have, all right, we went through this one. 35% uh, of older adults do not um, mount the defense against SARS-CoV-2 after two infections. So, or two infections, <laughs> forgive me, two vaccine doses. All right, we covered that one. We'll have the link as well. Second wave. The reason this is important because by the time this came out, 50% of the Indian population, one and two, uh, were already had mounted uh, immunity to SARS-CoV-2, but yet it still began to spread. Uh, so as of January 22nd, 2021, it says antibody positive, positivity was observed in 50.7.6. All right. The presence of infection-induced immunity from SARS-CoV-2, even in more than one or two people, can be ineffective in protecting the population. Now, that goes into, now, obviously, India is doing really, really well right now, but that goes into, for example, the Israeli aspect. So it's really interesting for where it's just, you could have half your population was exposed. You're talking India uh, and still have issues, but to proceed. All right, mRNA COVID-19 vaccine and development of CMR confirmed um, myoperocarditis. Now, this is important for a real, real solid reason. And hang on, I'll put you on a pause one more second. Hang on. So here we go as far as basically what they're claiming. All right. They went through the whole aspect here. And let's just go down to, if you look at the clinical presentation of a lot of the, the uh, the frequencies of fever, chills, breathlessness, and so on and so forth. They predict, their, their, I don't say predict, their data indicates there's about 10 cases of myocarditis for every 10,000 doses of the vaccine. Now that is extremely high. To the average individual, it may not, but when you consider millions of doses of vaccine are going out there, you're gonna 10 cases for every 10,000. That's a hundred per hundred thousand, and the reason they're going by doses is because obviously people are taking one shot, two shots. So let's say it's ten thousand cases or ten thousand, ten cases for every ten thousand doses. But one person may get two shots. You see where I'm coming from? All right. So this was 0.1 percent of all vaccine doses. AstraZeneca they found they did not encounter any myopericarditis, but your AstraZeneca has not been approved for use in the United States, so we're going to pass by that one. If you're in Europe, they've already uh, administered a billion AstraZeneca shots. Um, it would be nice to have that option here in the United States, but I think uh, they keep in prior f applying for FDA approval. See, it's not about it's not about being it's not anti-vaccine. It's getting the right vaccine, and you know loyalty should go towards the best medicine not to the companies which you favor. So Oxford University and AstraZeneca, it's just not here in the United States as of yet. If you want, it's a real interesting, if you want to go into this, the story, why this has not been approved in the United States as of yet, it, you'll, it'd be quite intriguing to proceed. All right, here we go. Do, do, do. It says, most occurring in otherwise healthy young men and occurring with an instance of five to 25 times the usual background rate. I'm only reading what they're, they're putting here, as of April 2021. So they estimated an incidence of one case of myocarditis in 100,000 vaccines. That's what they had claimed. And separately, 1.8 cases of pericarditis for, per 100,000 vaccinations. Our data should suggest a tenfold higher incidence seems surprising. Remember, we're going one in every, you know, one in every 10 in every 10,000. What did you do, do just to, re, to reiterate that number? 10 out of every 10,000. So I'll just say one out of 1,000, all right? That's what I originally wanted to say. 
It's important to understand that the port of Diaz at Dell, this is the one that they used in reference to myo pericarditis, was essentially based upon the collection of administrative health data and not upon the direct investigation of patients with protocolized approach as we used in our study. They obviously quote him. In support of this is the initial report from Israel of a 1 in 3,000 or 1 in 6,000 incidents of myocarditis following vaccination in young adults. So even then, it's not 1 in 1,000 yet, but it's, that's what the Israeli study was coming up with, a lot larger or more frequent incidents than basically what was coming up uh, in this one report that we used uh, prior, which was like 1 out of every 100,000. So when it's actually, it was not one every 100,000, it was actually, as the researchers claim here, is one out of every 1,000. So to proceed, one of the largest cohorts of date described the need for heart failure treatment. In 40% of its myocarditis patients, despite an absence of prior heart failure episodes, and intensive care in 10%, just to repeat, the limitations, this is their argument, it's important. We acknowledge the association does not by itself provide evidence of causation, although the tight temporal coupling between vaccination and symptom onset represents a strong causal signal also described in other reports. So basically it gives you a strong idea that it needs to be investigated even further, not just to look at that one study of one out of 100,000, if they're coming up with one out of every thousand and the U.S. is using that study as one every 100,000, uh, better to uh, cut that off at the pass real fast. So myocarditis appears to be an unpredictable and relatively infrequent side effect following vaccination with COVID-19 RMRA vaccines. It is more, most common in younger males and appears to be self-limiting with supportive therapy. This is relevant to ongoing public debate regarding proposals for vaccination of children under the age of 16 in whom the balance of benefit and risk may be more finely balanced. Our findings may also contribute to the debate regarding booster vaccine doses and those with prior documented myocarditis episodes. Ongoing monitoring using large scale national reporting system is essential for both the prevalence and relevance of post vaccine myocarditis to be truly understood. So the links will be there for you to follow as well. Real important, especially since we just seem to be pretty cavalier and uh, the risk to benefit ratio as far as children to COVID to myocarditis or myopericarditis. Proceed as follows. Further evidence that vitamin D might protect against severe COVID-19 disease and death. I'm just going to read through this real fast. And some of the Mendelian randomization they utilized to, to show basically what they had. And um, they found that a lot of the studies weren't taken into account UVB radiation. Uh, so when they came out to be like, eh, reference to vitamin D, uh, they brought that to the attention as far as confounding in other studies. This could be because UVB radiation sunshine, the most important source of vitamin D for the majority of people was ignored. All right, to proceed. Research for the first time looked jointly at genetically predicted and UVB predicted vitamin D levels. Almost a half a million individuals in the UK took part in the study. An ambient UVB radiation before COVID-19 infection was individually assessed for each participant. When comparing two variables, researchers found the correlation with measured vitamin D concentration and circulation was threefold stronger for UVB predicted vitamin D levels compared to genetically predicted. Researchers found that ambient UVB radiation at an individual's place of residence preceding COVID-19 infection was strongly and adversely associated with hospitalization with de and death. Now, the statements from the researchers. There'll be links to this as well, so you can go into it on your own, but you get the gist. They're trying to say UVB played a huge role that they basically just given people 200,000 I use of vitamin D once the second they ran to the hospital was probably not the best uh, way to conduct the study when other studies were done prior. They're saying there had to be a correlation of vitamin D leading up to it to proceed. First, Professor, our study adds further evidence that vitamin D might protect against severe COVID-19 infection, conducting a properly diagnosed, di diagnosed, designed COVID-19 randomized controlled trial of vitamin D supplementation is critical. Until then, given that vitamin D supplements are safe and cheap, it is definitely advisable to take supplements to protect against vitamin D deficiency, particularly with winter on the horizon. Second professor, given the lack of highly effective therapies against COVID-19, we think it's important to remain open-minded to emerging results from rigorously conducted studies of vitamin D. Third, our study supports the recommendation of vitamin D supplementation for not only the maintenance of bone and muscle health during the lockdown, 
but also potential benefits in relation to protection from COVID-19. And the articles from nature.com are there as follows, as far as the uh, methods of research, so on and so forth. Real important, again, very few governments have I ever seen really even pay attention to vitamin D, even though the correlations tend to be strong in most studies. But however, though, you know, if they really care about you, you know, it's not a conformity issue, then wouldn't you want to mitigate the disease in every available uh, uh, possibility from UV lights, ionization, ozonation, diet wise, so on and so forth? You know, it's, it'd be, it'd be like eat healthy, be healthy, not just stay healthy, you know. So there's there's aspects to it which show there's a really it's about winning and not necessarily about the health of the individual. To proceed as follows: What pushed Israel a herd immunity? All right, uh, we went through that. Uh, the vaccine itself dropped into fifty percent after five months after the second dose. Uh, people need to know, and uh, a lot of the studies that you're reading in the paper are really sh- within a short duration of the second dose. So they're like one or two months or sometimes even a week. What the Israelis did is they wanted to follow what happened after. And that's why the booster shot thing became so important to them. But if this is every five months, you know, that's going to be, there's got to be other ways of going about that. Proceed. All right. Adverse reactions. This is interesting. Uh, with uh, medical staff with histories of allergies. Now, they're obviously concerned about the vaccine itself. Now, I'm not going to go into trying to alter publisher bias, and of course, we're, we're time is limited as well. Let's go into the the, uh, the listing of the effects into the full study itself. All right, now check this out. Here, here we go. All right, first vaccination, second vaccination. You see the doctors, nurses, technicians, clerks, students, and so on and so forth. All right, this is all right. First vaccination is obviously we did this before. Remember, we did this last week with the uh, was a week or was a week prior with the. Uh, uh, women that were lactating and their reaction, injection site pain and percentage of individuals, well, that's pretty obvious. Swelling, fever, look at that, fever, fatigue and malaise, uh, the second shot. Now, you again, risk to benefit ratio. If you have healthy individuals who are not that vulnerable to the negative outcomes of COVID-19 or likely to spread it, all right, because that's the second argument. Um, look at that. The, the, that is going to affect the performance overall. And plus, the person's not going to feel good. And people go, well, you're not going to feel good off of COVID-19. Remember the case in the beginning was like for like a 50% asymptomatic or 40% asymptomatic rate? So, again, it's just like, wait a second. But that's that's pretty much not asymptomatic in 80% of the people at the second shot to proceed. All right, age rates, so on and so forth. Uh, Adverse reactions. All right, that's not even the point that's even there. There's the p-values. Let's get right to the uh, right to the the main aspect. Let's see, moderate reactions. Fever, body temperatures above 38 degrees centigrade or higher. Other adverse reactions that interfered with daily life and required medical treatment. Yeah, this is the very bottom of the, the, the chart here. Let's see if we can make this a little bigger. So you can get there, just in case it's not rendered in 4K. Look at, uh, you have to look at basically what's happening to the individuals right here. Fever, look at the percentages. And for example, that individuals are having as far as what's occurring. Fatigue and relays. The reason this is important because this particular table right here, interfere with daily life or require medical treatment chills which is like extremely high and you know joint pain so to so forth uh muscle pain outside the injection site so again you have a really high uh adverse reactions that continued for more than two days uh percentage of individuals which basically have succumbed to especially fatigue it's that's why a lot of athletes if fatigue and malaise is going to kick in you know and that high level uh, and you're an athlete, you can see why a lot of athletes are reluctant or a lot of uh, team managers are reluctant to vaccinate their players if it's going to reduce performance, especially if you have about half of them resulting in fatigue and malaise and a good like maybe one out of 10 to um, 
one out of five uh, requiring, you know, having a, a fever or flu-like symptoms, we'll just say. All right, the next one. Research identify food products that can reduce COVID-19 transmission. I'm only going to read an excerpt here because we are running short on time. Group of research, the group has researched droplet formation for years. When we heard sneezes transported aerosols over 27 feet early in the pandemic. Research found, ready for this? Check this out. Research found that ginger reduced the amount of saliva expelled from a sneeze by more than 80% and was as effective as a mask in reducing the distance of droplets and aerosols from a sneeze. And they also expand, experiment with cornstarch and xanthan gum and so on and so forth. But ginger was as effective as a mask in reducing the, the distance of droplets from aerosols from a sneeze. Amazing. All right, here we go. Virus evolving to get better. Now, keep on. This is in reference to the Alpha variant. In the Alpha variant, the d- dominant strain circling at the time of the study was conducted put 43 to 100 times more virus into the air than people affected with the original strains of the virus. We know that Delta variant circulating now is even more contagious than the Alpha variant. So the original study they did with the masks, it was, you know, was 43 to 100 times less virulent than the Alpha, the alpha uh, variant. Then the Delta variant is even more infectious than the Alpha variant, so who knows what's doing anything unless you do up-to-date studies. So the face covering significantly reduced viral linen particles in the air around the person with COVID-19 cutting the amount by about 50%. Unfortunately, the loose-fitting cloth and surgical masks did not stop infectious virus from getting into the air. All right, the links will be there for you as well. All right, and also too, a few out of running out of time to cover. Uh, you know, they are going to be doing research and links to uh, between mental changes after COVID-19 vaccination. And so they are going to be looking at that. And this is uh, my blog here if you want to look at it. Uh, but also, too, let's get right into the data. And here we go. Again, we are going to be saying the VAERS data is the first one we'll be covering. And this is just reports, too. So keep in mind, reports, too. Does that mean reports from reports, too? So let us begin as follows. Ba, ba, ba. Here we go. VAERS data breakdown, if the thing there goes, if I was wondering if it was going to come up. All right, here we are. Serva, 4,059 reports to. Shingles, 14,866 reports to. Bell's Palsy, 5,798 reports to. Average age right there. Uh, Thrombocytopenia, 3,193 reports to. All right. Paralysis, which could sometimes be a little bit of a mixing between the Bell's Palsy. 4,925 reports to. Myocarditis, we just covered. Look at the average age there. 4,975, most frequent age, right there. Thrombosis, 7,729 reports to. All right, COVID illness, we'll just say breakthroughs. 77,186 reports to. Notice the average age is a little lower. Uh, duplicated reports, again, most some people, again, if you don't, pay attention to your database, you can you get to have more reactions than there should be because a lot of these, uh, for example, like this Vera's ID here is duplicated quite often. All right. And then you can read, for example, uh, some of the reactions, for so on and so forth. All right. For example, bah, bah, bah. vaccine reaction reports by vaccine, January 2021 to September 18, 2021. 558,780 reports to. All right, by age. Reports to. Uh, please forgive me if I emphasize uh, dramatically. I'm just making sure it gets heard. Our reported COVID vaccine related deaths, 6,740. Reported to. Uh, this is the, the alterations of the week. It doesn't seem to have slowed down that much. Uh, death to VAERS. Uh, reports, COVID mortality, just breaking it down there. Let's get straight to the, I'm going to go past the word clouds. This is the vaccine reactions compared to 2020. 558,780 reactions reported to VAERS uh, compared to 57,115 reported to VAERS of all of 2020. So you have about a tenfold increase. There's 2020 right there. There's 2021. Uh, if you wanted to read for example, a lot of people don't realize exactly how heartbreaking uh, a lot of this is. Let's say if, if make it a little bigger. 
It's just so you can read, so you can get 4K. If you get to read what I read on a regular basis, uh, you you think, you know, it's very sad. Uh, you have to read a lot of these people which have lost individuals. And they're not just people just writing things down and just submitting them. Uh, you know, you know, the, basically they're well documented and, you know, it's unimaginable. And I really get, I'm, I'm really disturbed by the, the media per se, whatever it is, I don't care the channel, uh, that they don't actually look at the, the writing, what goes into these reports. They're not just superfluous reports when someone just like writes on a napkin. Uh, they are basically, they are very, very detailed reports. Uh, and then basically, yeah, the correlations, but they're not just, they're just, they're not just superfluous. If you get an opportunity, read some of these and I want to slow down so you can read, uh, on the, on the screen as well. All right. To proceed as follows. Da, da, da. Yeah. You can get like some interesting aspects too. All right. So we scroll down. This is the uh, most common symptoms. We're going to go past that. We're just going to go right here. Let's make this a little smaller now. All right. And make sure we're on the same. Top reported symptoms of all, all by age. All right, let's still have to go smaller here. There. All right, so that's what's the most, I don't know, what, I have to take this as a stop word, please forgive me. Uh, but headaches, fatigue, chills, so on and so forth. This is the most common reactions by age. And then uh, we go, these are individuals that have succumbed or if there was a relationship or fatality uh, somehow around the time of inoculation. So there's reports too. Uh, COVID-19, this seems to be a pretty heavy one. Again, uh, this one, the reason I focus on the COVID-19 is because COVID-19 pneumonia and COVID-19 cardiac arrest, cough, fatigue, these are symptoms which may, you can see a relationship per se, uh, again, safety signals. Pulse absent, well, obviously that'd be mortality, uh, but you can get an idea. But you look at, for example, cardiac f failure, congestive, cardiac failure, cardiac respiratory arrest, chest pain, uh, you know, chest x-ray abnormal, you can start, you can start accumulating them and start getting, uh, picking up hints and clues. All right. And then my minors and lot numbers will pass by that real fast. That, uh, that's the n number one report appears to be, um, from children and yeah, chest pain, fatigue, headed for, again, it's, you do you write this off as far as, uh, yeah, you have all ages seem to really to be a lot of, I mean, I don't know how do you could compare with vaccines in the past or other vaccines or type of vaccines. I mean, is chest pain a real common, uh, report in reference to other vaccines? I don't, I honestly, I don't, don't know because this is just coming in so fast and so many, and it seems to be this, this, uh, grouping between, you know, ages and so on and so forth, as well as other countries. I, why, I mean, is it psychological? I don't know. Again, I would like to see the studies in reference to that to either to go through this as far as either confirm or deny. All right. And then that's the vaccine reports. Ba, ba, ba. I'm looking for other information here. It may be pertinent. And that's all for me later on. All right. Let's go into COVID rebuild. I'm all going to do a real fast comparison. Um, this is the average age right now. Mortality as of September 18, 2021. So if you look here, 85 years or older is still is your largest, most effective age group, uh, mortality wise from COVID. So really you're looking at, these are your most vulnerable groups. So once you get above 50 and again, not knowing with comorbidities and so on and so forth, but 85 or older. Now look at one to four years of age. I mean, I can't even get the thing on there. It's 54. Now every life is valuable. So you have 54 mortality, this is all of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
145 between 5 and 14 years of age, 1,297 uh, had succumbed between the ages of 15 and 24. And you, you can get the picture the rest of the way. And you could see the most vulnerable age groups. Now, in order to protect these most vulnerable age groups, we've locked down all of this. So again, I don't know. That's, I'm just looking at the data. That's all it is. Proceed as follows. Let's look at Florida. Now, Florida is interesting. And Texas just kind of hasn't moved. But let's just look at it real fast. Because all of a sudden, the weird part about Florida is the precipitous drop. up It just passed 60 minutes. So I have to hurry this up. All right. So there's Florida. You see that drop right there? And then this is new deaths per 100,000. Yeah, they were on their way. California had a hot, remember, this is all share on the same y-axis. California was higher than Florida at one time in January. Then Florida just dropped and just dropped. And you notice this little pattern. Now, Texas is on its way up. But we'll see what happens with Texas. Then the, we broke the, the dates down a little closer from July to September, the net right there, that arc, and it just went down as Texas is going up to September 13th. And then, boom. Florida was like in the papers. And now, of course, Texas has a, a large migration problem, which could be playing a role into this here. So I don't want to fault Texas yet because there's too many variables involved. But look at Florida. And boom, it just dropped. And now it's almost about the same area where California is. Even though California and New York fared better in the long run as far as mortality, that spike just came out of nowhere. And what caused that drop? See, that's the correlation. That's it. Why did that happen? If it wasn't for vaccinations, if it wasn't for lockdowns, if it wasn't for enhanced masking, why did that drop occur so rapid, so precipitously? From, I think, uh, you know, just only a few weeks, because that's September right there to the September 16th. Yeah, and September 19th is our day today. And there we go there. And then mutations. All right, I'm going to go real fast this one too. Here we go. When it comes up. All right, the mutation wise, all right, this is what we'll look at. All right, I'm gonna pass through all of this right here. I just want you to focus on one thing if you can. All right, number one, the only, the, this is a weak correlation because I see emissions and boosters because people, once they're in the hospital, maybe getting boosters, so that's probably not the best correlation there. Uh, 0.93, hospital admissions and ICU admissions, yeah, well, you gotta understand the correlation. The only correlation that kind of is weird is the boosters in the ICU admissions. All right, there could be a lot of confounding there. Now, what I want to look at is this. This is the correlation between people fully vaccinated and total cases per million. We're, we're looking at a leaky vaccine, no doubt. All right, here we go. Uh, this is death smooth per million. You can see going up and down as vac the vaccinations there. Now, here we are. Pay attention to this bar right here. People fully vaccinated, 60 to 100. 60 to 100 per 100 individuals. So I don't think we have anybody at 100 per 100 as of yet. And a human development index of 0.64 and a population of more than 5 million. All right, this is their basically their total cases per million. Now, I'm going to scroll all the way down real fast and just focus on the cases per million. Uh, the, now, this is reproduction rate as well. We're going to look at the reproduction rate also well, too. There's your cases per million, 50 to 60 people per 100 vaccinated. All right. Then we scroll down, 40 to 50 people uh, vaccinated per 100. And that's where that bar right there is where it's 60 to 100 vaccinated. And don't worry, if you lose track, I'm going to show you, bring you to a graph, which I'll explain more of it. 20 to 40, there's your case per million uh, for the 60 to 100, and that's the case per million, 20 to 40. All right, here we go. Ready? Let's just go scroll right to the bottom here. Then we go to 0 to 10, so you get the, the point. But you can see the countries as we go down, as far as 10 to 20 per 100 vaccinated. And then, of course, we're looking at you know, after the while, 10 to 20 still is your reproduction rate, means how likely the virus is going to spread. And then 0 to 10, <laughs> look at this, 0 to 10. Now remember, this bar right here is 60 to 100 uh, per 100 vaccinated. 
people fully vaccinated. This is your zero to 10. These are people with this country which hardly were vaccinated at all. This is their cases per million. Again, keep an open mind. There could be other confounding involved, but still just the same. And here we go. You ready? Let's just go to the other charts as well. Now, remember, hardly anybody's vaccinated, so when people are vaccinated, it, it jumps all over the place. And there's your countries. All right. Well, actually, I should make more of a buffer there, but you get the point. But here we go. Da da da. Now, let's not pay attention to this one. Let's pay attention to this one. All right. Total cases per million. What this represents right here is 0 to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 69, uh, 59, and 60 to 100 is people per 100 vaccinated. All right, so here we are, 0 to 10. You have 17,883 total cases per million. And 0 to 10 people are va- per 100 are vaccinated. Now, 60 to 100 people are vaccinated. We have 78,169. Let's go to deaths per million. 0 to 10, people vaccinated, 0.83. Deaths per million in countries, again, development index is 0.64, and populations of more than 5 million, 0.85. And here's all your in-betweens. You can see the DX axis here. So 0 to 10, 0.83 new deaths per million, 60 to 100, vaccine per 100, 0.85. Reproduction rate. All right, there's a date right there. 0.78. What the heck? This is just the data from our world and data itself. 0.78 is the reproduction rate in countries whose vaccination rate is 0 to 10 fully vaccinated. 1.03. In the most vaccinated countries has the highest reproduction rate. What the heck? Seriously. Now, there could be a lot of confounding involved, but but I am not going to be a fan of inoculation policy with the current uh, inoculators, per se, if that is the outcome. 1.03. It's a reproduction rate in countries where 60, at least a minimum of 60 people per 100 are vaccinated. Compared to all the other countries which are lower in the reproduction rates than the countries with the most vaccines. Now go to the next one. New cases smooth per million. I had to readjust the y-axis here because the 0 to 10s fell off the bottom there. 51.45 51.45 new cases per million in the areas with 0 to 10 people were fully vaccinated compared to 164.17. Now, albeit new cases per million are the highest in the 40 to 49 range, but still just the same. What the heck? You see what I mean? All right. Let me, if you want to freeze that right there, go for it and uh, go through the data on your own. Pull it out. See what happens. It's, it's just befuddling. Uh, trends, for example, the Delta deaths per million in the United States at six. You see it keep on rising. Uh, positivity rate still going up. Uh, fully vaccinated still going up. Deaths are fully vaccinated to uh, population you know, versus that. India, Delta variant still number one. New deaths per million. Yeah, off the bottom there. Positivity rate off the bottom there. Uh, fully vaccinated, not going very far, but neither does the virus at this point in time. All right, now Sweden, again, with lockdown measures and things like that, they are higher in the vaccines, so we'll give it that. Uh, yeah, they went up to one, one death per million. Looks like they shot up where the United States was at, just to, to reiterate, six per million. Maskless Sweden is one. And then positivity rate, pretty low. And see, they're a little more vaccinated right there, blah, blah, blah. And so, but still just the same. They had different NPIs, non-pharmaceutical interventions. All right, are basically our variants. There's our mu. So where's mu pop up? Mu is in Spain. 
So lucky you've been on mute. Remember, we didn't have mute last time, but there's mu. Uh, these green bars, obviously delta. And so let's see how mu was the week before. So Chile, Mexico, Spain, the United States. This all because you don't see Chile here. This just means it didn't report as of yet. This is uh, September 6th. Looking at mu again. Since I really want to focus on mu, since that's the newest riser. Uh, Chile, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Mexico. And there is Spain at 0.24. And Spain is at 1.61 now. So we'll see where that heads. And we can go all the way down to the back where there was not even delta. But again, with due expediency of time, let's go over to our Europe area. And then as soon as we're done with Europe, this is what we'll look at. Uh, serious reactions, we're at 524,889 serious reactions. AstraZeneca, Janssen, Moderna, so on and so forth. Overall reactions at 954,001. Moderna, Pfizer, Janssen. Uh, again, as far as all reactions, serious reactions are ones that require hospitalization. So 524,889 reports to the Dura Vigilance. Uh, again, reports to Dura Vigilance, 954,001. This is interesting. The reports to Dura Vigilance went down. Last week, I think we're in the 14,000 range, and now we're down to 11,715, so there may have been a readjustment. Just, just to give it a heads up. Uh, most common reactions, as far as they're concerned, and serious reactions, joint pain, chills, fatigue, headache, so on and so forth, down the road, they have chest pain, and so on and so forth, but a little different than the reactions, which is interesting to me, because chest pain is down here, uh, as opposed to joint pain, chills, fatigue, so it's really interesting. But also, too, uh, AstraZeneca, which is a primary vaccine, did not have the myo uh, myopericarditis as we reviewed earlier. So due to the fact that AstraZeneca is so out there as far as uh, one of the major vaccines, uh, is that what is liquidating uh, the chest pain aspect? Because it's uh, basically diluting that one aspect. We're in the United States, it's primarily all mRNA. Where AstraZeneca is the Oxford University one, so maybe not. We'll see. All right, and then let's see, for example, web scrape. We did, I think, yeah, we looked at zip file size and so on and so forth, and we looked at that. But let's, it's late. So let's just call it a night and let's review what we reviewed real fast. Ba -ba -ba. All right, our data sources were healthdata.gov, GSI aid. We went through our world and data. We looked at Endure Vigilance. We looked down here, ba, 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 where's COVID, da, da, da. We looked at the VAERS, all right? And then our research was as follows, going backwards. Backwards, we go to uh, virus is getting better to become airborne. Far better, it looks like. Uh, do, do, do. Uh, ginger, uh, for example, it seems like it's, the, they said it, not me, they said it. It was effective as, as a mask and reducing the distance of droplets, meaning the masks either don't work very well or ginger is very, very good. All right. Side effects to look out for for people which are allergic to vaccines. Yeah, it looks like a, uh, looks like, yeah. All right. And let's see. Da, 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 that's from this one right here, the study. All right. And then we looked at basically what's pushing herd immunity uh, with Israel. And they showed about 50% effectiveness below after five months. Um, Vitamin D, um, raising uh, dominance again, predominant, uh, as far as attention to it. Uh, RNA, uh, as far as my pericarditis, uh, they believe the, uh, the authority figures on hand underestimated the actual um, dimensions of the um, uh, potential uh, negative outcomes. Second wave, it's amazing. The amount of people that have already had immunity to, uh, not immunity, but had some sort of... Uh, uh, resistance to SARS-CoV-2 by that time, over 50% of the population in India was exposed. And we looked at the India data now; it's like wow, they're like they're like breezing through it right now. Um, basically, a lot of ums. Base, do, 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 basically, a lot of basicallys. All right, uh, magnitude uh, basically among older adults. We just covered that real fast. 35% of older adults. Do not even seem to mount of adequate defense against SARS-CoV-2, even if the second uh, second vaccination. 
um, as quoted there. Uh, pesticides, destruction in the environmental microbiome, ba -ba boom, sci-fi stuff, but is it possible? And then nitrous oxide required for basically the nutrients to create its epidemiological cycle. Very, very, very intriguing out of the box thinking, which needs further investigation. Again, it is late. It's one of our longest videos. Thank you. Gratitude to all the great researchers here. I learned a lot of these preprints still need to be peer reviewed. But again, I'm very, very thankful to the researchers who submitted the research as follows. And also, too, for those still listening, I am humbled that you have hung on this long, and I greatly appreciate it. Please keep in mind, it keeps a little time before it prints out the fork, prints out the fork, renders the 4K. But regardless, thank you, gratitude, and I'm very, very happy you watch. Catch you in a bit. Bye.